Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series on matters of national and international importance. I'm Robert Barwick, and my guest today is the Executive Director of the Licensed Post Officers Group, Angela Cramp. Welcome, Angela. Hi. All right. Today, we are going to give you the perspective of the licensed post offices, the nearly 3,000 small businesses who run post offices around Australia, on the Christine Holgate Australia Post Cartier Watches Saga. Now, regular viewers of this program will know that we have talked about this a lot lately because we think this is a very important issue to expose. So much of the way it was initially couched um, proved to be wrong, but um, there's a matter of principle, which is why we're, we're exposing it, but I think if people also understood this perspective, this, this issue from the standpoint of licensed post offices, if you had any reservations about what might have gone on there, it would transform your view. And that's why I wanted to get Angela on today. Now, before we get into the interview, though, I, I have to make an announcement. We, we are recording on Sunday, the 7th of February, um, because this week we are mobilising to get a lot of people who support us on this issue to call the two shareholder ministers for Australia Post, and they are the Communications Minister, Paul Fletcher, and the uh, Finance Minister, Simon Birmingham. And we want people to call with one message. Tell them to reinstate Christine Holgate. Because on the weekend, the Financial Review reported that the government is, uh, or the, the Australia Post Board and the government would approve, is getting close to reappointing a new chief executive. What they're trying to do there is, in a sense, intimidate the opposition to backing away and accepting that um, this is a done deal and there's nothing you can do. No, that is not true. We, are, we will show you that what was done to Christine Holgate was an injustice, not just to her personally, but to the institution of Australia Post. And there's plenty of legal aspects to this that are yet to be resolved, right? And we, will not, we should not let the government get away with just um, tying this up quickly in a bureaucratic way by saying, oh, there's nothing else we can do. We've appointed a new chief executive. We want people to call them this week and say, you, what you've done is the wrong thing, reinstate Christine Holgate. Especially because the breaking news this week was, if you know the story, th this, this affair blew up over the purchase of $20,000 worth of Cartier watches, and that, that was claimed to be a misuse of taxpayers' money, yet the government has since spent well over $100,000 at, at least on a lawyer's report, and $350,000 looking for a new CEO, when the lawyer's report confirmed that Christine Holgate had done nothing wrong. So the real ta waste of taxpayers' money here is by the government. This is getting ridiculous. Just reinstate Christine Holgate, and you'll see from the rest of this interview why. So we've got the instructions on the screen there. We're going to come back to that later, but please pay attention to this interview and do not just be a spectator. Get involved by making those calls to those ministers this week. So that out of the way. Let me now let Angela Cramp speak on behalf of the licensed post officers um, because she, has, she and they have the very best perspective on this. They are the number one stakeholder in Australia Post, a service that we probably all take for granted. They supply it, right? And when you hear their version of the story, you'll be amazed. So Angela, let's just start with a basic question. Why are you and the LPO group calling for Christine Holgate to be reinstated? We have seen what success can do, what a successful CEO can bring to Australia Post. Now, I've been a licensee for 20 years. There are plenty of licensees that have been from the beginning, so more than 30 years, and they quite often worked for Australia Post before they took on a license. So some of them have been around for 40 years in the business. Right. They've been through the previous CEOs, and we all agree there is nothing like Christine Holgate. Her leadership, her quality, her passion, it made a difference to Australia Post. Like we were expected, the, part, the previous CEO predicted that Australia Post would be $300 million in the red by now. Christine Holgate took the position in 2017 and has turned the business around. She's come in with fresh eyes, 
with a view that she can make a difference, that she can be successful. And she has proven that she can do this. We do not want to go through another learning on the job CEO who is going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars trying things that won't work. We've yeah. done that. We've been through that. Christine Holgate has a proven track record. She embraced the whole company and she has brought everyone along on the journey. She is excellent. So you, like, you, you say, sorry, Angela, you say she embraced the whole com company. And I think what you mean by that is your experience as licensed post officers was for a long time not being embraced by the management, not being embraced by the government. And just describe what that experience was like all those years before she got there. What did licensed post officers go through? How hard or, or, or um, how easy was it to run a business as a licensed post office? Like it was dire. In 2012, a vast majority of us were, if not insolvent, very close to it. In 2001, unbeknownst to us as franchisees, the Board of Australia Post and the CEO made a business decision to stagnate the BPR. Our payments used to be linked to the BPR, which is the basic postage rate, the stamp, right. the cost yes. of yeah. an ordinary letter. Our payments were linked in 1993 to the BPR. So when the BPR, when the basic postage rate went up, so too would licensees payments. In the 20 years prior to the LPO agreement being accepted in 1993, the BPR went up 544%. So it looked like a great idea to link our payments to that in yeah. as soon as the government and Bob Hawke decided to take this on. He was he was the person who did this. Right. Right. He decided that Australia Post was too expensive run as a like as a public service yeah. they needed to corporize it so he did it they instigated the lpo agreement they sold off the corporates to licensees because it was much cheaper to run as a small business than it was under the unions so we right. had our payments linked to the bpr with the expectation that the bpr would rise like it had for the previous 20 years so in 2001, the management of Australia Post stagnated the BPR for 11 years. We got no payment increases for 11 years. Everything else went up, yeah. but the money that we earned did not. It was dire. It, it basically sent so many licensees to the wall. I had three licensed post offices at the time. And I was actually selling investment properties and our family's assets to try and keep the doors open. And we realised that we would not be able to survive. Like the money pit was drying up. So and we what... had to do something. We went to the government. We went to Australia Post. We went to everybody trying to make people understand that we were in dire strife. My understanding, my understanding, and I may be a little bit wrong here, but this is a rather unique model, the way Australia delivers its postal service using the licensed post offices. And between you, collectively, you've invested something like $3 billion of your own money so that the government can deliver a constitutionally mandated national service on the back of your personal investment and yet you've been, you were left out to hang out to dry there. It, well, I might point out, you said you didn't get an increase from 2001 to 2011. The 2007 election campaign, uh, Angela, which Kevin Rudd won, was defined by the cost of living crisis in Australia. So all those years, actual cost of living was going through the roof and you're not getting any extra return for the, the work you're doing to provide postal services. 
So as, you, as you're trying to do something about this in the 20 teens, um, what are you getting back from management in terms of addressing the problem and what are you getting back from politicians? What did you find? We got nothing back. The management of Australia Post said it's not their problem. They were not responsible for the profitability of licensed post offices. If we weren't covering our cost, they suggested we needed to invest in another business to prop up the post office. Now, I had three very successful post offices. Like we were very busy, we didn't have downtime. I had four people working full time in two of them and we couldn't pay our bills. Like we had no time to have a second business to cover the cost of the post offices, even if I had enough money to go and buy it. Like yeah. it, it was not the solution. Yet Australia Post felt that it was not, and, and they, they were quite open that they did not give any guarantee of the commerce of the agreement. If we couldn't fund it and cover our own costs, that was due to lack of management skill, apparently. That was how they viewed it. So, so what you're describing, when I first heard about this, it, it, straight away it seemed to me what, what you've got here is the government the government, it's their responsible providers postal service. The government is exploiting these 3,000 small businesses in order to do it. And if that's we the- were, We were the political football between Australia Post and the government. The government said Australia Post's role is to provide the community service obligations. So the government said, you have got the monopoly service. It's your problem to fund it. But in 1993, there were no parcels going to PO boxes yeah. or in the mail. Generally, if, if we ever got a, a letter, a parcel in 1993, it was a very small parcel and it was dropped on our front doorstep. Nobody had signature on delivery. There were no you know, massive online traders. There were very few parcels. And a box of wine was never going to fit into a small piece. <laughs> so the actual model, the business yeah. model from 1993 has changed dramatically. And when parcels started booming, our payments were not, did not have any relevance to the parcels. It, and, and that was a, uh, an oversight in the original agreement. Yeah. No, there was no mechanism for change. Nobody foresaw what was going to happen. Nobody understood that the internet was going to yeah. boom and parcels would be going through the roof and over the post office counter. Australia Post didn't have to pay us for parcels. Our payments were linked to the letter side of the business. So when the parcels started booming, Australia Post started booming, but they did not pass on any of that to us because there was no agreement in our LPO agreement to say that they would have to pay us for it. We now, got Angela, that rate fee. Angela, one other aspect, which we'll deal with in more detail later, but I just want you to describe on top of all this, you're also providing banking services to the customers of the big banks um, and how what was that like especially as banks were increasingly closing their branches and and people in those suburbs would have to go to the post office what was what what, what effect did that have on on how the post office operated in in that with with that res, um, phenomenon happening like it was crippling for us. Um, I owned the post office at Lightning Woods for 15 years. Now, the next town is 80 kilometres away. There is one bank in Lightning Woods, no other bank. If anyone wanted to come, like if anybody wanted to do their banking for anything but that bank, yeah. They had to come to the post office or travel 160 kilometres round trip. So they chose the post office. The businesses in town would come in and on Monday they had three days taken, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. 
I would be paying one of my staff to stand at the counter for maybe 20 minutes to count that money and to make that deposit for that local business. I couldn't say, I'm not doing this. I paid my staff member for 20 minutes. I got $1.38. Like, yeah. you add up that. And this is, the town needed us to do that. Like, we couldn't say to all of the business customers in town, no, you are crippling me, go away. In my metro ones, the school canteens wanted to come in every day. Like, they come in with a lot of coins, small notes and coins. And I hope the canteen ladies that used to come in are no or are not listening to this because they could not count, right? You were seriously, every day, <laughs> it was wrong. So we really had to spend a lot of time bagging all their coins, counting it all, fixing up their deposits and, and correcting their mistakes. We would be doing that in our metro office for probably 15 to 20 minutes. And I was getting a dollar thirty-eight for that too. My, my rent in the metro office was a yeah. lot higher. It just was not cost effective. And this is multiplied around the country. Most school canteens banked with the Commonwealth. We've always done Commonwealth banking. Yeah. So, you know, and like, the, AN, uh, the Red Cross, they come in and bank their door knock appeal coin at the post office. We get we got a dollar thirty eight. Like it was, it was. Yeah. Now this 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 is an incredibly important insight because people don't know how it actually works. And of course, the it's important to know this because we're now going to talk about Christine Holgate coming in as CEO of Australia Post and looking at all this and how she chose to deal with it. So just describe the just describe what the Christine Holgate experience was like from anything you want to say about it and the difference she made as the CEO to all this whole picture. Right. Uh, most people that come to the post office think we are paid by the government to do their job. They yeah. do not understand that we have a transactional payment scheme. So if we don't have people coming into our post office, we don't make any money. If they come into our post office and we are getting an unfair amount of money for that transaction, we still don't make any money. Christine Holgate contacted LPO Group before she started and said she would like to introduce herself and she would like to, you know, discuss the future and what we saw that she might be able to bring to the business. And she asked for our list of pain points. Boy, that was just eye-opening. It was the first time anybody has ever done that in my 20 years as a, as a licensee. So... First and foremost, because it was one of my biggest bugbears, I said banking. And yeah. we went on to discuss a list, which we had probably 10 things on that list. She took the job um, and the first thing she said was that she was going to look into the banking. She looked into the banking and found out that it was actually costing Australia Post about $50 million to provide this service. That money was actually coming out of most, most of that money was coming out of licensees' pockets. Yeah. We were still having to pay all of our overheads and our staff and not having cost recovery at all. So she set about doing something about it, and she did. She actually lifted our payments by 50% if not more, depends on which area you're in. Yeah. Like we all have very different post offices. So right. some people do a lot of banking. Some people don't do as much. Yeah. But generally speaking, our payments went up by 50% for banking transactions, which for me actually paid one of my staff their wages for the yeah. year. That's a big difference to my small little business. 
then she started looking at why are we not getting any share of the profit from the parcels? And the next year she brought in Nicole Sheffield, who is an expert in retail. Like she's just a powerhouse understanding how to get people to come into post offices. The previous CEO believed that post offices were dead in the water. Everybody could do everything on their smartphone and we right. were really redundant. Christine Holgate believed that the retail footprint of Australia Post was one of its biggest assets. Yeah. And it was the way to engage in communities across the country and make Australia Post the community hub for everybody to actually have a service industry in their town. She brought in Nicole Sheffield, who actually understood how to entice people back to the post office. Came up with new innovative products that we can sell, changed the traditional ways that we, you know, assess parcels, just refreshed everything and, and modernised what we do. Like, really exceptional never seen anything really as driven as those two and like once she had settled that in she then went on to reform the payments for Australia for licensees these are payments that had not been changed since 1993 yeah so they basically upended the bucket looked at you know what they could really do quickly and easily and how they could move our payments away from the declining letter service into the or to to link it or associate it with the booming parcels business and thank goodness they did because if we had operated like we did in the last 12 months under the old scheme i don't think there would be Right. A licensee open today. Really? Well, so, no, so look, my fellow Australians, our fellow Australians, they, this is so important for them to understand um, through your eyes this long term picture and um, how hard going it was. And then here's this chief executive who comes along who actually bothers to address problems. And that's half the pro that's half the issue right there. She bothered to address the problem that previous management had not, and she succeeded. Now let me just remind viewers that what the what this we'll focus on the banking thing for a second. She had um, Christine Holgate had gone around the world visiting before she took over as CEO, visiting post offices around the world, and she from that experience she had seen that a key way to secure postal services in this modern technology era where there's less mail is through combining postal services with financial services. She saw it in Switzerland, she saw it in India, she saw it in France, and she came back thinking this could work here. She consulted your LPO group, then she, then she led an executive team in going to the banks and saying to them, you've had a good wicket all this time, we, you now have to, and, and this has come out of the, the licensed post office's pockets, you now have to pay. Now, Angela, I think it's very significant that one of the big four said, well, we're not going to pay for what we've been getting for free, right? Um, that shows you this was, this was not a, a lay down mazette. This was a, 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 an intense negotiation. The big banks and all and the smaller financial institutions between them put up $220 million. And then, so that was very successful. It made a huge difference, but um, uh, that wasn't enough for Christine because then she made sure that a big chunk of that or a significant a big enough chunk of that went back to you, you guys, right? Instead of just pocketing that as oh, this is look at this is the good for the bottom line, I get a bigger bonus. Right. Now she made sure it went back to the licensed post offices. So this is extraordinary. So what I've described there is, is the deal called bank at post, right? And so that's the description. Do you think that the executives who she rewarded a $5,000 roughly Cardia watch each for that deal deserve that reward? Absolutely. 
absolutely every licensee thinks they were entitled to a lot more. If they were happy to get a $5,000 watch, Cartier or any brand, yeah. fabulous. Like it, and really, it's a testament to her leadership. Like those people could have expected $150,000, yeah. apparently. I mean, I'm not up to speed with executive bonuses, but for the level of revenue that they brought in, the expectation that they would have got a much higher bonus is quite real, apparently. Yeah. But if Christine Holgate, you know, she gave them a watch because she wanted to mark this moment in time that these people went out of their way. It wasn't their job to do this. This was not part of their contract or their KPIs. Nobody said this could be done. Everybody said the banks will not agree to this. Give it up. Forget it. And Christine Holgate and this team actually the, were determined to make it happen because yep. she had committed to it. And, like, look, she did it. You know, it, it is pretty much why we are so passionate about hanging on to her for grim death because we do believe it is grim death without her, without the quality that she brings to this position. Like, yes, she can find another CEO apparently for $350,000. You can find an imitation. We do not want an imitation. We want exactly what she can do. And if they can't find a clone of Christine Holgate, we just don't understand why we don't have the real thing who is still under contract to Australia Post. And, and I, don't want to, I don't want people to miss a very important point you just made there because a lot of people, the, especially the way that the government, the Labor Party engineered this to, to, to turn into a uh, misuse of taxpayers' money, you know, Cartier watches, splurging money in a, in a recession, etc. A lot of people get hung up on the watches and, and a common refrain is, why should they be rewarded just for doing their own job? And well, your that, argument is they, that, that is, wasn't their job. Yeah, yeah. That is the biggest problem. It wasn't their own job. The yeah. previous team who did get rewarded for the deal that they did, which was part of their job, signed Australia Post to a contract that cost us $50 million a year. Think yeah. about that. They got a bonus for that. It came out of our pockets. It was to help out the big banks. It yeah. was not to help out us. Like, so Christine Holgate decided to do something about it. She talked to these executives to try and work out what they might be able to do. For a year, they worked on it out or outside their actual yeah. contracted roles and they pulled it off. Like, yes, the ANZ was not interested in retail customers, so they decided to decline the offer and they no longer are part of Bank at Post. The other three saw that they could service their retail customers through the post office and agreed that they had been paying some money previously, but nowhere near enough to cover the cost. They agreed to chip in and cover the cost of the service. But, you know, this is $20,000 that was awarded to these executives and licensees, when we heard this, when this all blew up, the Friday after it happened, we started sending $5 notes in registered envelopes to the Prime Minister to cover the cost of the watches. Like $5 from every licensee well and truly covered the cost of the watches. Yeah. Seriously, if I had known this was going to happen, I would have written Scott Morrison a check for $20,000 to make sure that Christine Holgate went back to work the next day. But never in my wildest dreams did I think that this was going to blow up. No, and let, I hope people are taking this on board, what, what you're saying now, because th this perspective is so important. Um, so let's just, 
what you've just described, they went above and beyond. This wasn't their normal job. And, and they went above and beyond because of Christine Holgate's unique and visionary leadership. She's not just any CEO. Um, and that's why this is so devastating. But just for, to set the scene, 22nd of October last year, 2020, Christine Holgate is called before Senate estimates. Conveniently, the rest of the board wasn't there when usually the board does attend these things. There were, there were reasons for them not to be there. Um, it's a four hour Senate estimates hearing and you know, the heads of government business enterprises are used to these kinds of hearings. That, that, that was not a problem. Nothing was untoward until suddenly Kimberly Kitchen, the Labor Senator, ambushes her out of the blue with, this, with, with questions leading to this uh, issue of her spending $20,000 on Cartier watches. And she said to, she, she started grandstanding to Christine and said, um, is, that a, is that an appropriate use of taxpayers' money? And Christine said, it wasn't taxpayers' money. And for that, she's been absolutely crucified, even though she's actually right, because Australia Post pays tax, it doesn't receive anything from the taxpayer. But then the media hopped in and spun it and made the public feel as if this spending that we're hearing about for the first time was happening in the middle of the 2020 pandemic recession. And then the Prime Minister goes off his nut in Parliament and is very abusive towards Christine Holgate. And um, before you know it, this is all blown up. So how devastating was that for you compared to these, this, this couple of years where everything had been transformed under Christine? And what's it been like since? Like, it was just devastating. And it was devastating. We have a, a Facebook licensee group. There's 1,200 licensees on it. Everybody was devastated. Like, the common response from everyone is, I just feel sick. I don't know what we're going to do. Like, we need to stop this. This is just wrong. Like, and I still feel that way. Yeah. I am absolutely horrified of our future. Like, you know, if we want to talk about these overpaid executives who, you know, shouldn't have been getting the watches for doing their job, the banker post contract should have been renewed by now. It was about to be um addressed i suppose you could say in, in october that was one of the things that christine was about to get into okay here it is we're february now and nobody's done it whose job is it to yep. go back to the banks two of the banks signed for three years and one of the banks commonwealth signed for five years that contract is up yeah September this year. It should have already been renewed. Nobody's done it. So, you know, like, where is the executive team that is charged to do this? Yeah. Like, this, the, the executives are still there. It is not their job to do it. Nobody is doing it. It is terrifying for licensees. Like, what are all these people that rely on now the post office for their pensions and their cash? And the people that can't do internet banking, yeah. people who can't drive, it, like 50% of the population are digitally disengaged. You know, their skill sets are not uh, up to speed, I suppose, now. Like some people struggle just to work out sure. which way to put the card in the machine. Sure. We're there. We help them. We help them get their money. We help them live their life. It's their independence. They can go to the post office. And this is something that is so vital to so many communities. And for $20,000, Christine Holgate got people to spend a year convincing the banks that it was necessary. Now she's gone. Well, she's, I believe, standing aside for the unforeseeable future. But those people, those executives in those roles are not charged to renew this contract because it was not part of their job. Like, it, that's the proof that yep. you know, they weren't paid to do this. This went above and beyond 
their contracted roles. Well, given um, given the difference that the Bank at Post deal made, though, and as you've said now, it's it's in suspended animation. So you don't know if that deal will continue. And if the deal doesn't continue, or if the, for either because it's not negotiated properly or the new CEO, given what's happened to Christine, will not be game to, to take on the same kind of issues she did, right? Because this, is, this sends a huge message across the board. Um, Australia Post could find itself and the licensed post officers could find themselves back to where you started if that deal expires, right? Still expected to provide financial services that come out of your pocket. Um, but, the, but she proved with that deal that Australia Post is actually a very good provider of financial services and the way you've described it at that retail level. For the people that there's so much about the modern internet-based economy where the, the, the technocrats pushing it and the public servants that buy into that, they just leave people behind, right? They leave the, it's like with, on other issues, like the, um, the way you ex everyone's expected to do their tax online now um, and engage yeah. with Centrelink online, etc. It leaves so many people behind. So Australia Post can be that permanent service in so many areas, especially in banking. Um, Christine Holgate, her vision was that we would be the bank's teller, any bank. We would be the nation's teller. So wherever you went, you just yep. had to find a post office and you could transact on any bank. And like it makes sense. I mean, yep. yeah, if you try and have four bank branches in a small town, it's not cost effective. It, apparently it costs $3 million to have a bank branch a year in, in a town. Like, so you can get why with, with people moving online, the banks are looking to leave town and they have been doing it for years. Previously, they just shut up their shop and then put a sign on the door saying, we're gone, go to the post office. And that was crippling for us. This deal meant that we welcomed them putting up a sign and people coming to us because we did get cost recovery. We were able to manage it. And in, in, in a lot of cases, it did contribute to our bottom line. So it helped out the banks. I mean, I'm not sure the banks need help. They make a lot <laughs> of profit. And, what do you... you know, I would have been happier if the banks contributed $100 million instead of $25 million. I yeah. don't think it would have made a massive difference. The CEO of the ANZ refused to pay less than half of 1% of his annual profit to join Bank at Post because he felt it wasn't worth the money to pay. And un right. but unfortunately, we banks cannot, we cannot go back. And unfortunately, banks are moving in that direction where they are less interested in their retail customers. What do you and the LPO group think of Australia Post becoming a bank itself? Like it's terrific. It's something that everybody's been talking about since I first became a licensee. So for twenty years, everybody has been saying Australia Post should be a bank. We should be a savings bank. We should offer banking services. Like it's it's a very common call. Um, what we is... have heard for years is that the regulations in Australia uh, require change before it can happen. But this was Christine's solution. If the government and apparently it is the major players. Um, the major parties who must change the legislation, if they won't come to that party, then being the nation's teller is a start. Yeah. That well, was where she was heading. As, as you know, Angela, the Citizens Party, th this, is, this was our point of interest that first got us interested in this subject. And then meeting you and hearing firsthand the actual details about Australia Post, the, license, the structure with licensed post offices, what Christine Holgate did, made us realise this is a much deeper subject. But in, but in principle, our interest is we think Australia Post, we, we need, a, we need a, uh, a retail competitor to the private banks to force them to compete. And Australia Post is a perfect option. Postal banks are very successful around the world. 
There's, there's legislation being put up in the US Congress to turn the US Postal Service uh, back into a bank. It was one for a long time. Um, and it, it provides the perfect um, competitor to the banks, which the banks can't steamroll because it's owned by the government. And you have the best retail footprint to be able to take them on and make sure that services are provided. So this is, I just want to recap quickly the, the uniqueness of Christine Holgate, though, because from this conversation, um, she came to the to Australia Post with a management style where she wanted to solve problems. She, she um, embraced the whole organisation, inc and including the licensed post offices, right, and, and intended to address their problems. She had the vision of seeing that um, financial services, expanding financial services would be the way to address those problems. And then she made that happen and transformed the business, transformed the the prospects for the key stakeholder in that business, which is the licensed post office. And for that, for that, not for anything she did wrong, for that, she has been smashed by a very dirty political operation, which is why we need, when, if, if, if there's going to be any justice in this area, there's lots of things Australia Post can, can, can do in the future, such as become a bank. But we, in our organisation, agree with you it starts with reinstating Christine Holgate as the CEO. There what is are a the list other things that probably we should, like, yes, she embraced the business and every part of the business, but one of the stories that she has told me is her parents live in a small village in the UK yep. and the post office in that small village was going to close. And she understood, and she had nothing to do with post offices back then, but she understood how important that facility was for her parents in their small village and all the other people that live in that village. That village, the community got together and they rescued the post office and made it viable. So she sort of understood how important the post office is to a community well before she ever you know like she yeah. I, it was i think you know this is a personal connection she has ago. yeah so she not only embraced the licensees but she knew that the community had yeah. to have a viable community post office licensees are really just custodians of the community post office. The community post office will live on past any licensee and should yeah. do. And what she looked to do was make the business model viable. Yes, she was helping us out. Yes, she was thinking that we were being exploited. But her long-term vision was to make sure that the community post office lived on for the community. So every Australian... Exactly. Benefits from her vision. It's not just, you know, like right now I'm benefiting from it, but I will not be a licensee in another 20 years. There yeah. will be somebody else running my community post office then. And I will be, you know, an 80-year-old woman hoping to go down and get my money from the girl yeah. that helped me get it. Yeah. That's where she was working towards. Yeah not just the short-term focus. She wanted to make a business yeah. that would serve Australia for another 100 years. Uh, 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 that's what every Australian should appreciate. So there's, <laughs> you, you've been able to give an excellent People perspective. People think that the government is doing this. The government is not doing this. The government said to Ahmed Fahor, the previous CEO, yeah. if you can't make this business work, then sell it off. So he did. He sold yeah. off the GPO. He sold off a lot of the re remaining real estate to keep the post office propped up and working. Then he left. Now, Christine Holgate came in. There was no more real estate to sell off. There was nothing she yeah. could do to prop up the business other than to make it successful. So she made it successful. Like last year, through COVID, every every area of Australia Post drew together to serve the communities. Like it was a powerful year for Australia Post 
to act as one. And I have never seen anything as impressive all the way through every level of management, everybody looked after each other. And that came from the top. That which, is is why, which is why she went to that Senate estimates hearing thinking this was a, a story of triumph this year. And instead, she was ambushed and it turned into this, this, this political disaster it's become. Angela, thank you very much. Look, I call on all Australians to get behind this fight. Not just for, do it for Angela, do it for Christine, do it for the licensed post officers, but Australia Post is a national service. And if we want to keep it, and if we want to keep it in public hands instead of being flogged off to some for-profit, you know, businesses that'll just, you know, it'll turn into a version of the banks where, I, where the only branches kept open are in the cities and re regional Australia will miss out again. If we want to keep Australia Post in its unique national service, we have to get behind this fight because this was being run into the ground. Christine Holgate turned that in, around. She... Kept, she did it because she cared about the people, she cared about the stakeholders, she cared about the communities, and for that she's been crucified. And we have to, this is, this is one of those unique situations where the personality of Christine Holgate is important to the, to the, to the, um, the, the, the future of this organisation in whatever form it takes. We're not giving up yet that there is still a chance to bring her back. There, is, there are legal uh, conflicts over her status Right, so you know, we won't go into it any further than that, but it, this is not a settled issue yet, whether she's actually resigned as CEO. Um, so the government could save itself a lot of money could by backpedalling on the stupid position it took and reinstating Christine Holgate, which would restore faith in the institution and faith for the, the people that Angela represents, 3,000 or so hard-working small business families around Australia who are supposedly the natural constituency of the Liberal Party that um, have had the rug pulled out from under their feet because of this very nasty political assault that Christine Holgate walked in, in front of in Parliament on the 22nd of October. So this week, get, when, you finish, when you push stop on this video, look the, we'll put the uh, contact numbers on the screen. Call Paul Fletcher, the Communications Minister, Simon Birmingham, the Finance Minister, and say to them, cut the rubbish, reinstate Christine Holgate. That's all you've got to say. Say more if you want to, but tell them they must reinstate Christine Holgate. And let's let, let's let them hear from the Australian people and see if we can influence the decisions they make in the near future on this issue. So, Chris, uh, Angela, thank you very, very much for sharing your perspective with Citizens Insight today. Thanks for having us. I hope we... Do some good and I hope we can convince Australia that we all need to pull together to save our iconic Australia Post for ourselves. I think you've done a very good job getting that across. Thanks, Angela. Thank you.